Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out on a rainy Tuesday afternoon. Uh, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our kickoff event, what, it, what Was, What Is, and What Will Be, a cross-genre look at Afrofuturism, part of a celebration of Afrofuturism that will go into the evening and cross the street over to the Folger Shakespeare Library. Before I go further, let me tell you a little about the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. The center is home to the Poet Laureate, and Poet, Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, the only federally funded position for a literary artist in this country. It also hosts a range of programs such as this one, uh, mostly here at the library, but also at the Hill Center and around town and really around the country. If you want to find out more about our programs, uh, you can go to our website, www.loc.gov poetry. You can also sign the sign-up sheet, which is outside in the foyer. And we have surveys uh, on the chairs. We'd love to have you fill them out. I'll remind you at the end of the program, but um, please do so. You can hand them to me. You can leave them on the seats. You can leave them on the table. Wherever you leave them, we will find them and report on what you have to say. It seems like eons ago when dear Terry Cross Davis, the force behind the Folger Shakespeare Library's OB Hardison Poetry Series, contacted our office with the idea of celebrating Afrofuturism. Uh, and for those of you who know Terry, it's no surprise that she had a visionary plan in mind, as she often does. Much thanks to Terry, who's been so much fun to work with uh, over the years, um, for all that you've done, for all your behind the scenes work to make this happen. There was a lot of negotiating and figuring out and what made sense and how we were gonna do it. And I couldn't be happier at what we have in store for us this afternoon and this evening. Uh, as I said, there's an event uh, at 7.30 p.m. just on the street at the Folger featuring our presenters. Uh, you should note that advanced tickets are sold out, but uh, especially because the weather is not so great, uh, there'll be uh, a, a standby line and, and when tickets, should they become available, you can pick them up. That stand standby line starts at 6.30 p.m. So if you don't have tickets, I'd say try your luck and hopefully your luck will be good. Uh, I also want to thank our, present, our other presenting partner, the Penn Faulkner Foundation, and in particular, Programs and Logistics Director Shahenda Helmi. Where is Shahenda? There she is. Thanks, Shahenda, for all that you did uh, making this happen. Um, I'm very excited now to introduce uh, the foundation's new executive director, Gwydion Sullivan. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. Yeah, the rain did not stop this crowd. That's great. Uh, uh, my sincere thanks to the Library of Congress and to the Folger for making everything happen. We are really honored to be a partner tonight, uh, today and tonight. At, at Penn Faulkner, we work to ensure that stories and storytellers of all ages flourish, both in D.C. and all over the country. We give out the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, one of the top three literary prizes in the United States, and the Penn Malamud Award for the short story. We uh, also here in DC, we are Writers in Schools program. We bring uh, free books and authors into DC public and public charter schools to inspire the next generation of readers and writers. And then we also host events like this one in which we invite writers to help us in the words of the great performance artist and playwright Taylor Mack to help us dream the culture forward. Uh, we're going to be hearing from three very inspiring artists tonight, and the conversation they kick off will be incomplete unless you all help us carry it forward from here. So ask questions during the Q&A and talk about what we hear tonight, today, with the people you came here with, and better yet, talk about it with the people you're sitting next to who you don't know. Let's make it a robust conversation that leaves this room uh, and, and goes out into the world. 
so now I want to introduce tonight's moderator, or today's moderator, Cherie Re Renee Thomas. Thank you. She's an award-winning fiction writer, poet, editor, and her work is, work is inspired by myth and folklore, by natural science and conjure, uh, her roots in Memphis, and the genius culture created in the Mississippi Delta. Thank you so much, Cherie, and welcome. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. And thank you to Terry, who is a fellow poet and a magic woman in her own right. So thank you so much. I am honored to um, introduce these fabulous writers. This is a cross-genre conversation that we're going to have. Um, these writers write science fiction, <coughs> fantasy. They write horror. They write in stories. They write novels. And they write poems. Um, and new forms that we haven't quite given a name to as well. So um, the first writer I'm going to introduce is Tanana Reeve Du. <laughs> Tanana Reeve Du is an author, screenwriter, and educator who is the leading voice in black speculative fiction and in horror. Her short fiction has appeared in the best of year anthologies of science fiction and fantasy almost every single year. She is the former distinguished visiting lecturer at Spelman College, and she teaches Afrofuturism and black horror in the Department of African American Studies at UCLA. She also teaches in the Creative Writing MFA program at Antioch University, Los Angeles, and in their screenwriting program, as well at Santa Barbara. And she had the great distinct honor of having Jordan Peele visit her class, <laughs> which she documented as well. You can see that online. It was amazing. Dew is an executive producer of Shudder, which has a wonderful new black horror documentary called Horror Noir. It debuted on the uh, streaming network on February the 7th, right? So you need to subscribe and check it out immediately. She is the American Book Award winner, an NAACP Image Award recipient, and the author or co-author of at least a dozen novels. She's working on some new work as well. In 2010, she was inducted into the Medal School of Journalism's Hall of Achievement at Northwestern University. She also received a Lifetime Achievement Award in the Fine Arts from the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And her short story collection, Goat Summer, Goat Summer, which you can see right over there on the table, won a 2016 British Fantasy Award. She has been named to the GRIO 100 and to the Ebony Power 100. Du also co-authored a civil rights uh, memoir with her late mother, Mrs. Patricia Stevens Du. It was called Freedom and the Family, a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. Uh, Patricia Stevens Du is historic because she took part in the nation's first jail-in, which happened in 1960, and she spent 49 days in jail in Tallahassee, Florida. And this is after a sit-in at the Woolworth lunch con counter. Freedom in the Family was named 2003's Best Civil Rights Memoir by Black Issues Book Review. Her parents, including her father, attorney John Dew, were recently inducted into the Florida Civil Rights Hall of Fame. So she comes from an amazing family. In 2013, Dew co-produced a short horror film, Danger Word, with her husband, Stephen Barnes, and director, Lucina Fisher. Dew and her husband, science fiction pioneer Stephen Barnes, also co-wrote the short, which was based on their novel, Devil's Wake. It starred Frankie Faison from The Wire, of course, and Silence of the Lambs, and Cersei Scott. Danger Word was nominated for Best Narrative Short at the Bronze Lens and Pan-African Film Festivals. Du has also collaborated on the Tennyson Harwick Mystery Series with Barnes and in partnership with the actor and author Blair Underwood. Du also wrote a historical novel about the life of Madam C.J. Walker, The Black Rose, which was based on the research by Alex Haley. She has a BS in journalism from Northwestern University and an MA in English literature from the University of Leeds, England. That is Tana Nareev Du. Thank you. Our next author is Nora Jemison. Her pen name is N.K. Jemison. <laughs> N.K. Jemison, Nora is the first author in the genre's history to win not one, not two, but three consecutive Best Novel Hugo Awards, and all of them for her Broken Earth trilogy. Her work has also won the Nebula, the Locus Award, and the Goodreads Choice Awards. 
Her speculative works range from fantasy to science fiction to the undefinable. Her themes include resistance to oppression, the inseverability of the liminal, and the coolness of stuff blowing up. <laughs> she is currently a reviewer for the New York Times Book Review, and she has been an instructor for the Clarion and Clarion West writing workshops. In her spare time, she is a gamer and a gardener, and she's also single-handedly responsible for saving the world from King Ozymandias, Ozzy, her dangerously intelligent ginger cat, and his phenomenally destructive sidekick, Mad Pie, Magpie. Her essays and fiction excerpts are available, of course, on her website, nkjemison.com. That's Nora. Give her the applause. <laughs> Our wonderful poet is Era D. Matthews. <laughs> Era D. Matthews is the author of the poetry collection Sim Simulacra. I knew I was going to do that. Simulacra. <laughs> Winner of the 2016 Yale Year um, Series of Younger Poets Prize. The New Yorker has described her work as fugues text messages to the dead, imagined outtakes from Wittgenstein, start many operas, fairy tales. Matthews is virtuosic, frantic, and darkly, very darkly funny. Matthews' work has appeared in Kalalu, Best American Poets, Harvard Review, American Poet, and in many other places. She was awarded a 2016 Rona Jaffe Writers Foundation Award, the 2016 Lewis Untermeyer Scholarship from Brett Loaf Writers Conference, and a 2015 Kresge Literary Arts Award, as well as fellowships from Kaveh Kahnem Foundation, Kalalu, and the James Merrill House. Her current projects include a second book, Under Class, which seeks to lyrically deconstruct the acceptive narratives around poverty and class. She is an assistant professor at Bryn Mawr College, where she directs the creative writing program. That is Era D. Matthews. So our conversation today is going to be about a field of work which seems new to lots of people, but it has been evolving since, basically since we've come through the Middle Passage, since we, I mean literally it has. <laughs> it's a part of, it's a body of work that has come out of colonialism, post-colonialism, neo-colonialism, as well as in um, the African-American experience of slavery. Um, and it is now a, pro, um, a body of work that has evolved around the world. It is global in its conversation. It takes on many, many forms. I think of it as a movable feast, a movable feast in which there are lots of different Afro futures. And one of the things I would love for us to talk about today is what is each author's experience of the word? Because I wouldn't assume that everyone embraces it equally. Um, because there are a lot of spaces that it covers and then some spaces that it leaves unseen and invisible that we still have to explore. So we just want to take each author and have a chance to describe what Afrofuturism is or is not to them. Would you like me to start? Mm -hmm. um, I view Afrofuturism um, borrowing from Alondra, Alondra Nelson's um, essay some time ago uh, where she talked about the ontology of multiplicity. And I believe that as we kind of consider Afrofutures, the, bo the black body, both in present, future, past, we have to consider the ways in which we as authors can make the space-time continuum collapse. How we can look back, look forward, and be present at the same time. And I'm very interested in that inside almost any text. It doesn't have to be poetry. Any text, prose, poetry. Um, how do we think about identity as um, something that dissolves rather than something that hardens? And uh, Afrofuturism, at least for me, allows that opportunity, the opportunity to be many and one, the opportunity to be forward and back, and also the opportunity to think about at least my person, myself, as something other than what currently is the imagination as a powerful force in 
in oppression, which is what the black experience in America has been. That was beautiful. <laughs> wow. I'm thinking a lot about um, how I use Afrofuturism in terms of processing trauma as a horror writer, and that's something I got from my mother, so I co-signed to all of that, so beautifully spoken. Yes, that is true. The piece of it that most attracts me is how to take evil, for lack of a better term, interpret evil however you may. <laughs> it's very tempting as we're sitting here in Washington, D.C. to be very specific <laughs> about it. But interpret it as you may. To how to take evil, though, and, and create sort of a funhouse mirror image of it that is not the thing itself, but a visual or written expression of a thing that is frightening or frightful, and creating survivors. You know, I, I think of Octavia Butler's work, and her work is not largely considered horror. In your work, I mean, you know, there are hor bad things happen to people. Um, it's not considered horror, but there are lessons. Even in that trauma, as we watch characters undergo trauma, it helps us perhaps leach out our trauma. And you mentioned my mother, Cherie. You know, she, she wore dark glasses her whole life after she was tear gassed in 1960 during a nonviolent march. And she was the first horror lover in my life. So I have really learned as I've gotten older, and my trauma was losing her. So I've really learned as I've gotten older to see that aspect of Afrofuturism, the, the aspect of it that's in the shadows, that's poking in the spaces in the basement, right? The things that, that are frightening that you don't want to look at. That aspect has been very healing for me and hopefully is uh, for others. But I really want to echo this idea of a conversation between the past, present, and future because that's also something that's very deeply woven within the way I address uh, trauma in my, in my work. Um, I am painfully aware all of a sudden I'm the only non-academic up here. Um, <laughs> so I don't have anything super eloquent to say about ontologies and so on. I'm not even really sure what that is. But, um, but as, I guess, as a practitioner, <laughs> um, um, which all of us are, um, which, which everyone who is living and surviving in this country today to some degree is a contributor to Afrofuturism, um, I don't sort of traffic in, in labels and names. That, for me, is a thing of uh, academics. Um, I write what I write. People put whatever label onto it that they want. Um, and that has happened throughout my life. And sometimes I don't like those labels, and sometimes I just kind of go with it. Um, so to me, Afrofuturism, as I grew up with it, was music, was visual, um, was, were, were things experienced with the senses. It was not so much, um, they were things that impacted your thoughts um, through visuals and through, through uh, ideas, but not so much kind of like directly um, engaging with the future, not so much directly a story set in um, another world, another past, another life that could have been. Um, Parliament Funkadelic was Afrofuturism, a uh, brother from another planet. Um, these days, Janelle Monet is Afrofuturism to me. Um, I'm still coming to a place of acceptance that now Afrofuturism is texted, um, is textual, um, and uh, I am, I'm not really 100% there yet, because for me, there's, there's certain power in visuals and imagery that I, I know that text can do, but since I am not a person who visualizes my own text, it's hard for me to put those things together. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm accepting it. I'm slowly <laughs> going to do so at some point. Um, not there yet. Um, but I am also deeply and painfully mindful of the fact that once a word reaches Library of Congress level mainstream, um, at that point, that word has transformed beyond its intention, its original intention, and maybe is no longer a useful word. Um, so, you know, because uh, I will share a simple anecdote of uh, I got a call from a production company that was interested in me writing um, something Afrofuturistic, they said, for, uh, for some film that they were going to do or something. Um, and first off, then I was like, I don't write screenplays, I don't know 
why you called me. But anyway, um, so they, they asked me to do this and then I was like, well, um, so what, what kind of topic were you thinking about here? And they were like, well, we want something set in Africa in the future. <laughs> and I was like, well, I've never even visited Africa, so maybe you might want to find someone else who's from there. <laughs> um, you know, there are lots of writers out there from many of the countries in Africa. You might want to have a conversation with them about what they would con consider doing. Um, but to them, Afrofuturism was this incredibly limiting and super narrow um, lane that they wanted me to stay in, and I don't drive in that lane. I've never been there. Um, so, so I am mindful of the fact that maybe we should start looking for the next word to come. Maybe Afrofuturism is not the word that we should be um, trafficking in any, anymore. Um, but for now, I'll take it. <laughs> it's so interesting that you talk about music and other forms, performing arts, visual arts, as being your initial experiences with Afrofuturism and how that's really a, been a journey for you to think about <coughs> text work as Afrofuturism. Um, I would say the same for me as well. I think that one of my earliest um, experiences with music as well that I would think of as Afrofuturism, of course, was George Clinton, mm -hmm. Parliament, Funk, Russia, you know, mm -hmm. all of those things, um, as well as Alice Coltrane and John Coltrane, some of their music. Sam Ra, of course, being mm -hmm. of the South, was very fascinating to me. How does a man, you know, <laughs> from you know, the Deep South, the Bible Belt, um, mm -hmm. reimagines himself as an Egyptian, um, god of some sort, an alien that's come um, to, the, um, to the planet. But when we think about um, the experience, the experiences with an S, of being black on the planet, wherever that is, whether it's in the America or on the continent of Africa or in, in the numerous places of the diaspora, other parts of the diaspora, um, you realize that you are already in a dystopic reality. You are already a part of that. You know, Coldwell Eshoon, uh, the black Brit who wrote about this um, deeply in the 90s, talked about the first ships, um, the first contact, close encounter story was of, you know, us being taken from our homes in Africa and being brought to this other place for a whole nother context. And um, it's sort of an alien UFO experience. And how do you, how do you write about that? Um, um, Ara, I know that you have been writing poems in the voices of Egyptian goddesses. Mm -hmm. You know, how did you come to write your second second poems? And talk about that. Um, Sekhmet came to me actually as I was trying. I'm interested in visitations, like spiritual visitations from other things that are may not be in this dimension. I know that sounds odd, but I'm open to it. Just if it gets to the writing, I'm open to it. So Anne Sexton makes a show in the in the in the book, as does Sekhmet. And I was interested in what they might have to say about the subject, as whatever I was writing about at the time. So Sekhmet I'm writing about um, addiction. And so Sekhmet makes a show because uh, um, Sekhmet, they gave her, she was going to destroy a whole group, a whole army and then these kind of male gods came forward and like, well maybe you can just give her some liquor. They gave her some wine thinking and had her believe that it was blood that she was drinking and that would kind of calm her down and she would move away from wanting to destroy. And I just kind of thought about all the ways that we try to calm um, try to calm our natural natures, try to house our natural natures inside of something um, that is not what we want. So someone offers you something that's not exactly what you want, but you take it anyway. And so Sekhmet came to fore for me. I started thinking about what it is that she had to go through, how she, she was probably, and they have documented in myth that she drank a lot. And so, as did her revelers and her worshipers. And so I was interested in that. And how do you get that story out? I mean, we have co convenient myths. There are things that we want to remember about these mythologies that we follow. Um, but we don't actually get down to the root of the story of the myth. Like, what was the very human nature of the god? What was the very human nature of the entity that makes itself, forwards itself in any kind of mythology, whether it's Greek mythology or if it's Egyptian mythology? They're told um, in, in order to give us some sort of lesson from it. And we can't get the lesson unless we get to the humanity of the god itself. And so I try to drive for that. And I'm interested in all sorts of mythology. Um, 
but Egyptian mythology does um, come to the forefront for me primarily because those aren't the myths that are typically retold in the West. We don't know those myths. We know Zeus and Hera, but we don't know about Sekhmet and Ra. And why is that? And so I write about them because I care. I'm trying to make those come forward a little bit fo more in the work than have them recede to the background. Yeah. I know during the black arts movement, there was a conscious, deliberate effort by artists, um, Amira Baraka, Ishmael Reed, Sonia Sanchez, um, other art artists like Alice Walker to go back and reclaim some of the mythologies of the world and also tell our folk tales, our stories as well, and give them the same type of seriousness that um, Greek and Roman mythology had been taken. Um, would you say that this effort that, um, that's happening now that we're seeing in the body of work we're calling Afrofuturism for want of other words, <laughs> um, is also a continuation of that, but, explore, but it's almost like a Sankofa experience where you're, you're looking, you're trying to understand where we are right now by looking at that past and claiming it to talk about where we possibly want to go for the future? Absolutely, I mean, and the other thing that I think people tend to look for is they try to look for representation. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to have representation. And if you can find those Af African mythologies or the African philosophies that cater to what it is that you're interested in writing about, you can see a mirror in some way. What you were talking about early, earlier with the mirror, how important it is to see some sort of reflection of yourself. I could see a reflection of myself inside of the Egyptian myth. Um, I don't necessarily see a reflection of myself inside of other myths. I see other people inside those myths, but they always feel outside of my experience. So um, I do try and dig a little deeper and find where I can the myths that are uh, important to me and representative of who I am uh, and what I happen to be writing about at the moment. So yeah, I do believe that's important. And then when I was looking at your work, I was reminded of Audre Lorde's work a bit, um, The Black oh, Unicorn, <laughs> The Black Unicorn. I was <laughs> thinking, really like, what other speculative poetry tradition do we have? You know, what other poets are writing these kinds of works? I'm thinking of Robert Hayton's, you know, mm -hmm. American Journal, mm -hmm. or even some of um, early poems by County Cullen. For sure. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I'm also thinking of maybe Phyllis Wheatley, like the whole idea of imagining yourself free or imagining yourself outside of a white supremacist culture right. in itself is a, an act of futurism. You are, it's an optimistic, hopeful um, mm -hmm. act as well as a creative <coughs> act as well. Yeah. Um, Nora, in your work, you have decided to create your own gods <laughs> and to critique them, to, mm -hmm. to really expose them, as, as Ara was saying, the human parts of them, mm -hmm. um, to make that real for readers. Can you talk a little bit about what your journey was coming to that? How did you come to to building that work? And I know you have a new, she has a new collection that she hasn't, we haven't <laughs> talked about. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of the, the stuff that's in the collection is, is proto forms of the novels Can that I've remind them of that book uh, that they should the, get? <laughs> yeah, the collection, uh, my, my latest uh, thing that's just come out is a uh, collection of short stories called How Long Till Black Future Month. Thank you yeah, for the show and tell. <laughs> That's such a great cover, too. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, with uh, the cover images made by Creative Soul Photography, the guys who did the uh, series of black Victorians um, that ran, they're an Atlanta-based photography group. It's kind of awesome stuff. Um, anyway, though, um, so the, the journey that I came to write my own gods was probably similar to what you were doing because I was I was enamored of mythologies in general, uh, all mythologies um, kind of beyond what I was taught in school, which was just, you know, sort of basically Christian, which is has its own mythos form, although we didn't learn too deep into that. Um, we, I grew up, uh, I was educated in Alabama, so uh, we got the Protestant flavor of that. We did not get a whole lot of Catholicism or Judaism or any of that. Um, but uh, so, and, and Greco-Roman. And uh, so for fun, I read mythology as a kid. I read about the Egyptian gods. I read about um, American, uh, Native American, indigenous people's gods. Um, and the thing that always fascinated me was the ways in which gods um, 
reflect humanity um, and, and hold up a mirror to humanity. Um, there was a, a mythic tradition there of using God you know, to explore yourself, um, and that was a thing that I was just kind of fascinated by. Um, and the ways in which those mythic traditions impact people. Um, what you can imagine is what you can become. And so in order to imagine new worlds, if I'm writing things set in worlds other than Earth, I've got to reimagine what those people are capable of imagining. Um, and so you know, you end up kind of writing about imagination itself by literalizing it that way. I don't know if that answered your Thank question. You. Okay. Yes, it does. <laughs> I mean, because the whole act of, of science fiction, fantasy, horror is world building. It is cr the creation, it's asking what if. Mm -hmm. All writers ask what if, but in, in our genre, we get to play with the answers more, <laughs> <laughs> do a lot more. Um, Tanana Reed, can you talk a little bit more about, um, I will say this, my very first introduction to Tanana Reed's books was when I was working um, with Cheryl Woodruff, an editor at Random House, and she knew I liked the scary stuff. As she said, <laughs> you like that dark, scary stuff, Cherie. So she pulled out your novel, the Between, which is our very first novel. And I was blown away, one, because it was Southern, two, um, you weren't just telling a ghost story, but you were telling a story, it seemed, about our people, about what it means to be the specter in society and to have those shadows haunt you, to be haunted by that. And people think that you're crazy <laughs> because you, one, can see them, and two, you are fighting them, you know? And I wanted to talk a little bit about Hara and this this um, this experiment that we're doing here and um, right now, um, living in the age that we're living in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whew, where do I begin? But um, I want to go first to that question of world building and what that means, and especially when you can sort of see so much fraying <laughs> and so much crumbling right before your Some eyes, right? the idea of world building becomes so much more literal and important. And you, there's this idea that you want people to read your work and then put it down and do something, right? It's, I mean, it's not that there's anything prescribed in the work. It's just like, how do we, how do, we do this? So for me, a lot of that, you know, self-care, uh, or really world building begins with self-care. Let me put it that way. Um, the, my parents' civil rights generation taught me looking at their friends, the people who were my parents' peers from the 1960s, so many of them were burned out, were traumatized. When we wrote that civil rights memoir, it was hard to get some of them to even talk about it. They hadn't told their families they were arrested. One woman who was in Mississippi with my dad, a night he still reminisces about, almost cheerfully, she never went back. You know, so different people had different experiences, and I began to realize, you know, this is like, uh, PTSD, you know, this is like, these were veterans of a war, but it was an unspoken war, and it was happening right here in your own country, supposedly, right, unaddressed. So yes, I think she did bequeath to me sort of this sick delight from creating stories that scare people. I mean, I love when people tell me, oh, I read your book, I couldn't sleep. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Join the club! No, no. <laughs> pardon me, but I do think it's not just um, you know being uh, mischievous. I think there's there's actual uh, value in it. Not everyone has to like horror. Okay, I totally get it. If I like comedy too, sometimes comedy is your way just to let release it through a laugh. I have to laugh every day. I listen to stand up every day, but I also um, like one great example. There's this great novelette by a writer named Kaya Shanti Wilson called The Devil in America. If you haven't read it, go read it now. It's free, it's online, The Devil in America. It's on Tor.com. Tor.com. It is scary as heck. And what makes it scary is American history. And what I said in this documentary, Horror Noir, is black history is black horror, okay? I mean, not exclusively, we've had triumphs. We've been able to MacGyver beauty out of scraps, you know? The spirituals, DJ Lene Denise was the first person who woke me up to this idea of the, the, the slave spirituals as Afrofuturism, like you were saying. It's like, yes, utopianism, picturing something better and a roadmap. So, okay, we can both fantasize about something that isn't real, but also draw a roadmap for something that is real. 
And with horror, if you can heal yourself th by visualizing that trauma, Kaya Shanti Wilson did it in his way in The Devil in America, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that someone would go into a church and shoot nine people to death, nine strangers. I cannot wrap my mind around that. But I can wrap my mind around a demon. I can wrap my mind around a curse. And I can vanquish that demon. Maybe, maybe that demon has rules, OK? I can vanquish that demon. And even if I can't, I can create a character who shows me how to walk when I'm facing a demon, whatever the version of my demon will be. So I think that's what attracts me to horror, and I think that's the value of it. And I very much do like to weave in those horrific aspects of American history so people can, first of all, look, this happened. You know, because so often now we're, we're having this cultural amnesia where people don't remember. When I was a child, the whole country stood still and we watched Roots as a miniseries. I can't even imagine that today. So um, yeah, this happened, but also this is how you fight. So much to unpack in there. You had all these amazing references. Tori.com, of course, is where um, lots of um, wonderful writers are being published um, online. It's absolutely free, so definitely check mm -hmm. those works out. But also this idea about um, demons being vanquished, this you know horror encapsulating the things that we're afraid of in our culture. Mm -hmm. Um, horror, whether it's zombies or whatever, what is that really about? Mm -hmm. You know, is it a fear of homelessness? Is it a fear of um, uh, a biological disease that is uh, becomes epidemic? Like, what are we? Is afraid? Um, is it a fear of the underclasses taking power, taking control? See, that's what you know? I think. <laughs> I think I, I start yeah. to look at zombies now as mm -hmm. like that fear of other. The fear of other, yeah. and this idea. Um, there's a beautiful quote actually that Nora had. And you talked about, let me see if I can find it in my a zillion notes I wrote for this. <laughs> this idea of why, um, why you write. And this, this idea of what it's supposed to be doing. So here is why I write what, what I do. We all have futures. We all have pasts. We all have stories. And we all, every single one of us, no matter who we are, and no matter what's been taken from us, or what poison we've internalized, or how hard we've had to work to expel it, we all get to dream. And when you're writing about these things, whether it's um, science fiction, fantasy, horror, whether it's in you know, a story, a novel, a poem, you are redreaming the world. You are looking at it, but in order to redream it, you have to gaze at it with a heart's stance. You have to really tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And what I love about these writers here is that they, they have all of this truth telling in their art. They don't shy away from the hard work of telling the stories of that past generation that was broken up. They, mm -hmm. they, they sacrifice all this to be activists, to try to, to make present, to be the change in the world, right? And then they were spit on. Mm -hmm. And then they were, dogs were sicked on them, and their bodies were broken, and their vision was damaged. And some of them lost their lives. I'm from Memphis, so we're constantly mm -hmm. you know, reliving that wound <coughs> of Dr. King's murder. You know? um, but this ideal, out of all that, that fear, all of that trauma, whether it's Trayvon Martin or Sandra Bland, we can redream of what the world should look like and how, as you say, how we might walk that walk, you know, how we might model, even if we fall down. Can you all talk a little bit about what you do as artists to sustain yourselves in the falling down process? You know, sometimes on the outside we see the beautiful books, the, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the beautiful covers and everything, and it seems like a, a crystal stare of an experience for an artist. But there's a lot of darkness in that, too. Mm -hmm. How do you take care of yourself? How do you sustain? What are the models? How do you build community? Um, this is a thing I've been struggling with. So I will, I will share the fact that that is a struggle for me. Um, my writing is the means through which I process all that I'm experiencing. Um, you know, I, I have this really vivid memory of a really hot summer day um, while I was working on the fifth season. Um, and I was reading Twitter where Ferguson was happening and it, were, it was the pictures of the young man facing a, a troop of 
uh, American, they were cops, but they looked like soldiers and they were wearing body armor and they were carrying Uzis or something. And it was just some guy in a t-shirt that they were facing, but they were treating him like, like he was the biggest threat in the world uh, because he was a black man. And, um, and I remember seeing this and then I, around the same time the whole um, report was coming out that the city of Ferguson had basically been preying on um, its majority black population for the longest time, um, you know, sucking money out of them and giving tax breaks to its middle class white population. Um, and, and had built an entire industry around this. And you know, it just kind of hit me that this is what, this is what it's all been. This is really what it's all been. We exist, in their eyes anyway, to be soaked, to be used, to be discarded. Um, and I just had this utter, utter rage. Um, you know, and as I'm writing this story, you know, it, the, the, the broken earth, I think, started out being a little more mild than it was, and then I was just like, burn it down. Um, and then I destroyed the planet. Um, <laughs> But you know, I mean, this is this is this is the catharsis. Is when you're writing science fiction, you can smash the moon into the planet. You can wipe out humanity, and and it's it is a form of therapy. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, you remind yourself that no, you don't want all humanity to die. You remind yourself. You rewrite <laughs> the scene that you wrote so that people do survive. Um, so, that's for me. You know, when, uh, when you mentioned Ferguson, I think of my first moment of that realization, like, oh wait, black lives don't matter. You know, I was about 14, and there was a, a group of police officers who had been acquitted after beating a motorcyclist to death, and then they tried to cover it up and pretend his motorcycle had crashed, and there was a big journalism expose, but even with all that, couldn't get a conviction, and Miami burned, you know? And um, I was sitting in my junior high school cafeteria. They were playing Muzak to try to calm us down. It was a tri-ethnic school, so really it was just making it worse. But anyway, I started writing this like utopian sort of prose poem, you know, I wanna live, the first line was, I wanna live in a society where Jew is no longer a dirty word, no one remembers what nigger used to mean, and I just went on and on and on and on and I could breathe, I could breathe. And my mother said, you're so lucky that you have that, that you have that writing, because that's why, because I had asked her why, but why are people burning? That's their own store, that's just like, that's why. They're afraid, first of all, but you know, um, fear, anger is a mask over fear, so, so there was that. And absolutely, it is very powerful. Now I have to say, I've been working on a novel in progress for about five years, which is a long time for me, and even with teaching, there's no excuse for it. And mostly it has to do with the fact that it's just a difficult subject matter. You know, sometimes that place, your happy place, gets invaded. And in this case, I wanted very much to write about my mother's uncle, my great uncle, who died in a reformatory in Florida called the Dozier School for Boys in the 1930s, right? And I visited the site. My son was there when they were exhuming, you know, and, and he, he got to sift through soil and discover things, and it, it was a real, my mother never knew that she had this uncle, right? And these, there were so many boys who died at this reformatory that it has its own cemetery. And uh, actually, Colson White has had a novel coming out about the, that reformatory this, oh, this wow. July, which I'm sure is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I told them, that's what you get. <laughs> But I, you know, as much as I wanted to burn through it, I, the research made me cry. You know, the survivors have written books about it. I, I talked to survivors on the phone. I went to meetings. It's like it's hard sometimes to even go where you want to take yourself. So yeah, sometimes in terms of what do you do? What's the self care? Stepping away, mm -hmm. writing a short story. I've written several. Writing a script, just step away. But always remembering to come back. Um, for me, I think I take cues from my kids. I have four children, and the oldest is 20, the youngest is eight. And they have these rich, all four of them have these very rich imaginations. And um, I take joy in stepping inside of their world when I feel that mine is a little bit unbearable. Um, 
And how do I do that? So I taught them very, a long time ago, starting with my oldest, whenever you have problems with people, try to rewrite their narrative right where you are. It teaches empathy, actually. Like, right where you are, try to understand where that person is. It's a lot of work, right? But try to understand where that person is and rewrite their narrative. So we used to practice doing that by going to parks and watching people who were perfect strangers, who were doing either doing things that were odd or doing things that seemed slightly off, off center, if there is a center. And I said, okay, let's rewrite their narrative. So we just start coming up with things, retreating into our imaginations about why that person may have done the thing that they've done. And it trained them to always view other people with empathy, but also get out of our own narrative about what that person, who that person is. And by doing that, that actually helps me a lot. I rewrite people's narratives all the time. I'm very interested in imagining people with, um, with a lens toward empathy, with a lens towards trying to understand what makes them do what they do, particularly when they hurt and offend. Um, so that's one way that I do it, is I retreat to my imagination, but I also have become increasingly um, aware of the merits of uncertainty and just learning how to live in uncertainty. So um, when I start a poem, I don't know how that poem's gonna end. I just don't. I just know that I'm writing something toward an end, but I don't know how it's going to end. And I've come to live and be at one and at peace with that degree of uncertainty. The poem will figure out where it wants to be, and I'm just along for the ride. And so I think once I started doing those two practices with regularity, not just my writing life, but just my everyday life, there was a certain calm that came over me that helps me to care for myself and for other people as well. So what we're hearing as part of this process, sometimes taking a break, stepping away to recenter yourself, um, sometimes going, diving into the work and creating it and doing that hard thing, blowing up the planet, <laughs> and then figuring out your way how to be compassionate and loving and optimistic about it all over again. You know, and then also just being a witness as well, right? Yeah. Being a witness and, uh, and observing, um, as my friend and poet editor, uh, Duriel Harris says, those experiments of joy, watching the experiments of joy that are taking place all around us right. at the same time, right. you know, that's part of it too. All of that's in the Afro future, okay? All right, all of that is the practice. We need to do a handbook <laughs> on how to survive um, this current apocalypse <laughs> that we're in. Um, and how to get to that other future. Um, one of the things that um, um, I'm always curious about is why we have so many dystopias versus utopias. Like we know that we're living in you know, some challenging times and um, um, you know, we always thought, okay, it was worse then, you know, we're, everything's better now and then you look up again and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's a re you know we're, we're we're going back and forth in time here but it seems like the idea of writing a utopia seems to be like the the, the black unicorn of the genre mm -hmm. there aren't very many um, why do you think that is and what can we do about that because in order to to build the future right don't you you have to imagine it can we not imagine it working out I don't actually have an answer to that, <laughs> but I jumped to my microphone because I was on a, a program um, with Angela Davis a couple of years ago, wow. and she spoke to this, this question of Afrofuturism <coughs> and how even if you're not going to live to see it, you have to believe in that future mm -hmm. to do the work, right? Mm -hmm. So I think on one level, even when we're writing dystopia, and I'll use Octavian as example because I think Octavia Butler and so much of her work was like, wake up, wake up, you know. Um, if she didn't think that would help, why do it? Why, do, why shout, why, why try to bring attention to behaviors like if we uh, continue along this path, this is where we're going. I don't know the last time you read Parable of the Sower, but it feels closer and closer every time you read it. Some of us are already living in Parable of the Sower, right? And, and it's, it's this, desire to create something better. And the seed of utopianism in there is this religion earth seed that she created that some people actually do use as an actual religion. So it was helpful enough. It, it was something that could help people move toward something better than what she was depicting. 
And I think that's a piece of it, that sometimes our utopias are disguised as dystopia. <laughs> and I'm in, a, I'm in a, an anthology right now um, called A People's Future of the United States. I think you have a story in there too, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> and I'm reading these, I'm listening to the audiobook. I'm an audiobook junkie. And it's like all of these stories are absolutely unflinchingly looking at you know this moment in time and where we're headed and all of it. But there's a hopefulness to a lot of the stories. Someone said there was a hopefulness in my story. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, but I think, yes, I think because we do, we do believe that it can be better. Um, I want to piggyback off of you saying that a lot of our utopias look like dystopias. But I, I feel like that's because there tends to be a perception, excuse me, in, in the American zeitgeist or wherever, where uh, utopias are just straight happy times. Um, you don't depict ugliness, you don't depict people as they really are. Um, which to me is doing a disservice to humanity. That's not an honest utopia. Um, that, is, that is avoidance, that's, that's I don't know, um, denial. And so in order to truly show a world that could be better, you've got to engage with what the world is actually like. Um, and I found myself struggling with this um, not too long ago. I decided that I wanted to write um, a story that depicted a, a, a world without bigotry. Um, and I struggled because I'm like, how the hell do, like I am the product of a culture that has spent hundreds of years refining how layered and hierarchical we are going to, to construct ourselves to be. Um, and I, ca I, I had a hard time even imagining it for a long time. Um, and then I ended up writing a, a story called The Ones Who Stand and Fight, which is uh, in the, the How Long Till Black Future Month. Yeah, it's, it's actually uh, me speaking back at an Ursula Le Guin story uh, called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. Um, and in Omelas, I'm sorry, I have to spoil it. It's been 20 years. It's too late. <laughs> Spoiler statue of limitations is gone. Um, in Omelas, Le Guin imagines or, or asks us to imagine a truly amazing and beautiful society. Um, but then she shows us the worm at the heart of that apple. Um, because so much of our society is amazing and, and, and astonishing when you really kind of consider it. We live in the future. Um, and yet... Uh, for our amazing smartphones, there are our children dying in cobalt mines um, to, to pull up the materials that we use to make it. Um, so, you know, Le Guin was like, basically, this is what we've got. This is where we're living right now. Um, and so I decided that I wanted to try and envision and, and ask uh, readers to envision a world that was um, bigotry free. And it wasn't that I was trying to show the worm at the heart of the apple. It was that I was trying to acknowledge that people will take it right back to the, the place that it used to be. Even if you do manage to ever get us to this amazing world that we have such trouble imagining, um, it's gonna be a fight. It's gonna require a, a, a force of people to constantly work to keep it as good as it is. Um, and so that's what I ended up depicting. Um, and I called them social workers, but they kill people. Um, and that's what's necessary to keep a world safe from the idea that some people aren't important and some people uh, are expendable. Um, and it, it's, it's a constant struggle. I hate the fact that it's so hard for me as a black woman, as a science fiction writer, if I can't imagine a future like this, I can't ask other people to do that. So I needed to be able to do this. And it took years for me to manage that story. And I don't, I'm not 100% happy with that depiction, so I'm still working on it. I think it's hard to imagine utopias, utopias, if you will, because for so many of us, joy and peace are conditional. It's conditioned on a certain number of if-then statements that never come to fore. They, they, they just don't. And so I then resort to thinking about joy, if you will, as opposed to utopia, but just pure joy, like joy in small things and how one gets to that. Because even in these kind of dystopic novels, there's still people in there that are living their lives 
happily so. Like, you know, just they're, they're still living their lives to the best of their ability. I think about my grandmother. She had a fifth grade education. She worked in, she moved up from the great migration from Alabama to, to New Jersey to get a job in a factory. By my calculations, she made 73% less than the lowest paid white woman at the same factory doing the same job. She would come home every day with a smile on her face. And I asked her why, my grandmother also drank a lot, so let me just say that. It was, <laughs> but she had to find joy. It was self-care, right? So she would come home every day with a smile on her face. And I remember asking her one time, why was she, so, why was she smiling? And she was like, I have enough. I'm, I'm fine, I have enough. And maybe utopia is just enough, you know? Like the best we can hope for here is enough. And not kind of in the materialist sense, but in the purest sense, like I have enough. But also that she could look in the faces of her grandchildren and see future. And so the idea that you have enough, but you can still, you still have vision enough to see future. And I think knowing yeah. that her grandchildren would have more than a fifth grade education and, by, and, and certainly would not be making 73% less than some of the lowest wage workers, um, I think that bought her joy. And I think that helped her to live in her own type of utopia. And she, again, drank a lot. So that's what we gotta do sometimes, I'm serious. And, and to your point, contrast that with angry billionaires, right. you know? Exactly. <laughs> it's not enough. <laughs> it's not enough, nor is one lifetime, apparently. All the um, new science is being dedicated to, towards this path of immortality, you know? You know, one lifetime is not enough. And, you know, and have so many of the forces pushing, I am 100% in favor of space exploration, but not so that, I can't mention a name, um, but not so that certain particular people can go forth and, and live there. Um, away from us and leave us to die. Um, because that's what's pushing a lot of these private uh, attempts at exploring space. Um, anyway. And what do you think about the, the films that all make that inevitable, that the whole purpose of space, space exploration is to create a suburb for affluent people? <laughs> a suburb, a, a walled <laughs> suburb, a gated community. <laughs> Where the gate is literally, you gotta, rock, gotta have a rocket to get there, yeah. yeah. You know, I want a movie where we're already there. We're like, hey, welcome to the moon. What took you so long, you know? <laughs> we're already here, you know, but. Um, I mean, this is, this is the thing that I, was, that I was trying to work through. We live in a society in which there are multiple systems and multiple organizations dedicated to keeping us thinking the way that we do. Dedicated to making us believe that a better world is impossible. So, of course, if we ever manage to get out of that, we're going to have to have societies and systems designed uh, to, to work against falling back. Um, so, you know, envisioning those systems is what I've been trying to do. So in this body of work that we are de redefining every day, um, we are interrogating privilege we are revisiting the past and reimagining, giving more voices, the people's voice, the people's history, the people's future. Um, you know, taking up Zen's work, that monumental project, and forecasting it into the future um, by writers who are often seen as invisible in the genre, you know, or have been until history, till history, <laughs> right? You know, very visible. Um, we are looking at gender in different ways. You know, talking a little bit about Ursula Le Guin, of course, and her pioneering work and the women who were writing so bravely and boldly then. Um, thinking of James Tiptree Jr., which I think, I, I won't say who I thought it was in case I misquote him, but very famous writer, a uh, very famous Golden Age writer, said he would eat his hat. Is that what he said? If, if, she, if James Tiptree turned out to be a woman? I don't know about the one who said he would eat his hat, but he uh, refused to engage with the idea if it's who I think you're talking about. He refused to engage with the idea that it could possibly be, the tip tree could possibly be a woman because there was something ineluctably masculine about <laughs> his writing. So these writers are always, um, even just by the act of creation and publishing in an industry that says it wants diversity, <laughs> and then does many things to try to undermine that at the same time. Um, uh, we won't go there though, right? 
Uh. <laughs> you know, I was, uh, I was in Toronto last week when we were doing a screening for Horror Noir, and a woman raised her hand and said, I'm so glad you did this because I write speculative fiction. This is a young black woman, but I'm always having to defend my creative choices, even making the character black, okay? So while we're, we're talking about the progress that we've made, let's remember that there are writers like I did who are struggling to even put themselves in their own stories as though there has to be some overriding reason for a character to be black, right? Or that if you're a black writer, it can only be about a social issue and it can't just be a black girl with a dragon, which is what I told her, right? You know, yes, and, and I w by the time I got through college and grad school, I had started writing white male characters. And, I, and it was the between, the between that was the first and major effort of mine to say, I'm going to write me, and even then I was writing a man, but still, I was closer. <laughs> I'm going to write me, I'm going to put me in a story and see what happens, and thank goodness I did. That's when I found my voice, when I was, gave myself permission to write myself into my own stories. Giving ourselves permission to write, I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> and to write ourselves. Um, um, you talked a little bit about Twitter, and of course you have Narcissus <laughs> tweets <laughs> in, your, in your collection, um, where you're always, as Carl Phillips says, you're engaging um, with new media in your poems. You are challenging this idea that traditional poetry is text-based only, right. you know? Right. So um, you're doing some very um, um, innovative work in your writing. but. There's an interview, someone reposted for the zillionth time, um, Toni Morrison like laying waste yeah. to, an, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> to a journalist who, who did not intend, I guess, necessarily to get slaughtered in that interview. <laughs> but <laughs> this idea, well, when, basically, when are you going to write about? That was glorious. <laughs> it, was glo it, it was a clip from some interview. I don't know when this interview happened or what the context was. Um, but basically, the, the, the reporter who presented as a white woman um, asked uh, Ms. Mor I'm sorry, Dr. Morrison, um, asked, um, basically was kind of talking around it, but then basically was like, well, when are you going to write uh, white people in a substantial way into your fiction? Um, and was basically like, when are you going to grow up and start doing the real stuff? Um, she didn't say that. That's my interpretation. The let me not. Let me not. Yeah. That was my impression. But yes. like the yeah. tone, the facial expression, all of it was like, well, you know, you've done very well at writing this this nice black <laughs> stuff. So, but you seem to be a good writer. So why don't you do some real stuff? Oh. That was my interpretation. The term That's she my used dramatic was mainstream. When are you going to write the mainstream? Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And she's and Tony said back, I am the mainstream. Um, you know, she, she tore the woman apart. She was just like, you don't even realize how just unbelievably racist that was. The, the question that you just asked me just was. You would not ask white writers, when are you going to write somebody black? So, you know, I am the mainstream. She had, re, re, she had flipped that whole thing. She had flipped that script. The woman was trying to catch up. So, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Trying to catch up. <laughs> Um, Toni Morrison said, I stand on the, on the margins. I stand on the margins, and I claim the center as my center. I am the mainstream. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's just an amazing, amazing interview. Um, are there any last thoughts that you want to share with our audience about your journey through the area we call Afrofuturism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> One thing that comes to mind, this idea, I mean, yeah, we are the mainstream, but at the same time, we've also been pushed to the margins. Mm -hmm. And there's something about observing from the margins mm -hmm. that gives you a different view. Mm -hmm. And it's so valuable, you know, it's, it's a valuable contribution when someone who hasn't been invited to the party <laughs> can write about what's going on outside while y'all are at the party. Mm -hmm. And it creates a leadership potential so that when the lights go out and the music stops and everyone's like, whoa, where'd the party go? There are these people who are already out here saying, yeah, we knew that. Now, here's where you go. Here's the path. And, and there's a lot of leadership potential there in, in Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. okay, create space. Yeah. yeah, create space. And direction. And direction. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I want to go back to the question. You, you didn't bring it up. You brought it up, but you, we didn't go forward with it, which was about publishing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I know from because of the content that I write, the types of things that I like to write, it is often very difficult uh, to get my work in mainstream publications and mainstream poetry publications. It just is. I am the only Yale younger who's never been in Poetry Magazine. Why? It's because they don't understand what I'm doing. And I'm okay with them not understanding what I'm doing. I'm okay with them having that degree of uncertainty because that makes me think that I'm on the right path. If I am moving in the direction of, um, of being completely and universally understood, then that goes against what I'm actually trying to write. I don't write for universal understanding. I write so that I can understand it and make sense of the world that I live in, and that is my form of Afrofuturism. I'm making sense of the world that I live in according to whatever criteria I lay down on that page. And uh, which brings up the point that you were talking about. Afrofuturism can be, um, it can be joy. It can be uh, about oppression. It can be about any topics. It can be about new world politics that we haven't even imagined. It can be about any of those things. I think the, the definition continues to widen, which speaks to your point, Nora, about really probably needing a new word because it's not actually all encompassing in terms of what Afrofuturism seeks to do. It seeks to deliver a future. Futures come in many different forms. Um, so I just encourage anybody who's uh, thinking about writing speculatively or is thinking about writing in a different um, way than other people to continue to do that, write what you'd like to write, but also broaden your definition of what future means. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. that um, American Journal uh, is the title of uh, the anthology of our current poet laureate based on that poem um, oh, for sale uh, in our bookstore. But what you should do before you go off to get uh, American Journal and read about the great poems in there is get books by our authors in the back, have them sign them, and hopefully come to the event tonight. Uh, as I said, uh, it's sold out, but um, there's a standby line. Uh, I'm sure you, like me, want to hear uh, each of our authors read from the works they've talked so eloquently about. So until then, thanks so much. Please do sign, uh, fill out your survey sheets, uh, sign up our sign-up sheet in the on the back. Uh, we'll let you know about future events. Thanks so much.